uh, I'm a bit of a. It's just a bit slower. Yeah, so it's kind of a delay there between whatever. I have an academic background uh, and as well as a background in airline for a long time, work in industry. I'm at the moment uh, having a company called Cubic, which helps in the testing of blockchains. And I had expected Ulf to say something about that, but since he didn't, I will tell that. Blo I did. You did, I probably. But I, you I didn't want to take away your fire. I thought you would say something about the challenges in the blockchain, because as you all know, the blockchain is an open source thingy, and there's money involved, right? So you can download our code, analyze that this evening until, say, somewhere June, July, so that you can kind of know what the thing is doing, find this bug that we forgot, and make money, right? So our task is not to forget that, fixing that bug, and finding that before you do. And that's kind of different from a lot of software that I've tested before. Uh, I've worked in the financial sector as well. I've worked in telecom. But most of the time, uh, the, the connected nodes are all trusted. They are in the data center, and there's a guard in front of the door, and there's lots of firewalls, and you, you can't get in with your computer, say, oh, I want to participate in your game, uh, and, and transfer some things. So this is different. Everyone is kind of evil, in malicious at least, in our setting. It can be malicious because they want to steal money, can be malicious because they would just want to sabotage something or whatever. And there's so many scenarios that you have in the sense that everyone wants to be creative and make that money and we have to protect against that. So that, that's an interesting thing. The other thing that Eamon brought up is that this is high tech in the sense that we look at the newest research results and we want to put them in place and make a, a chain that has all the kind of goodies in the world in that one and single chain. Sometimes it's a bit overdone, I have to admit, because then, oh, yesterday there was something new, let's put that in place instead of the thing we just have made. But that's the kind of work that we do. So it's a kind of dynamic environment, and testing is very, very important not to lose money. So we based the, the blockchain on, on a large number of scientific papers. And then we have to validate that the combination of those different IDs is actually correct. And that's a cool thing to do. And then we, we have to implement that following those scientific IDs. So there's two, two phases in this. The validation that those IDs in themselves fit together, and that you don't take the, the wrong goodies, good parts and put them together and then it's bad, right? So you have to, to do that. And then you have to implement it following the scientific paper and, and make sure that you did the right thing. Now, I'm not going to go too much into detail to today how we test that, but, but I will show you a little bit of code, because I saw the password there, we love code, and when Tobias started showing code, he did that very quickly, right? You saw that, and that was it. So I will show more code, hopefully. I'll not, probably not more, but I will show code slower. Okay, so that, that's the, the idea, what, what I will, will do, and I'll tell a little bit, bit more about a little example that I happened to have as a kind of a homework last week or the week before I was on holiday because last week I didn't really work. But the, the problem was we have many peers that we want to talk to. And we can, as Ulf mentioned, talk to thousands of peers and, and tell them, hey, here, here I am. But it's nice if you don't have to talk to too many peers, right? Because that takes a bit of time of, what, of your computer power. And particularly if you are not so concerned in surfing the world, you want to listen a lot, but you don't want to say too much, probably. Anyway, you want to talk to a small subset of all the possible eternity peers. And if we think of this as having, say we, we, we are popular in a little country in Asia, then it's already immediately a billion users of the system and probably a million nodes, and those nodes have then to be served. So how do you do that? Well. The blockchain is distributed, and uh, if we start broadcasting all to all of the other nodes, then we have a little bit of a problem. So each node talks to only a subset of the peers. Which subset? That's the big question. Which subset do we select to talk to? Such that everyone kind of gets the whole information. Guess what? People did research on that. They actually wrote papers about that, and that's a lot in the peer-to-peer -peer community that solve these kind of problems. You have a number of distributed hash table solutions, et cetera, cores, 
whatever, as solutions. And then one of the questions, which one would we like to use here? And one of the ideas we like to use, not, not the complete idea, but one of the ideas is the Cademlia protocol. And this should not have been there. That's annoying. Can I get that? That was animated and should pop up later. But below this fantastic <laughs> side box is written how Kademlia works a little bit on, on a high level. <laughs> you have a 160-bit key. And you can compute the distance between keys by taking the XOR operation. And the nice thing of the XOR operation is then that you get a distance which is unique for each and every other peer. So each key has a unique distance to any other key, uh, peer because this is the XOR operation. Now in the paper, I can do that, I can show you the paper. Who of you is reading papers on a kind of regular basis? Oh, a few. That's very, very good. So you're not, not completely shocked if you see this. But this, this is how scientific papers look like, right? This is a lot of, you, you always, slow. Yeah, slow, but this is the paper. Uh, you, you cannot expect this. This takes a bit of a few days to read and understand, right? So that, that's the thing. So you have all these things. And then here they say, well, the XOR operation actually, we first know that XOR is valid, albeit not Euclidean metric, mm, of course. It's obvious that DXX is zero. Of course, that's obvious. Dx, comma y is larger than zero if x is not equal to y. Well, this is this is typical kind of. Okay, you have to believe that, and you have then you implement this distance. D D stands for distance, of course, right? So you implement that distance, and then you you have to check that this actually holds. So how do people normally test that? You've implemented D because it says that it, it should be like that. How do you test that? Well. You take an example, 0 and 1, that's two numbers, and you check whether 0, 0 equals 0. Yeah, it does. And whatever. You take a few examples. But with 160 bits, the question is which examples do you take? Did you take the right ones, etc. So that is where property-based testing comes in. And let me see if I can switch back. So what you really want to do then is to to test this for many values at the same time. You don't want to write test cases, you want to generate your test case automatically. So that's something that we, we do and that I will demo in a second. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that very often when I do the testing, uh, and you as well probably, is you test values that are positive, right, so that you know are going to be the right kind of values. This is kind of positive testing. So whenever you, uh, in a normal setting, test your application, you will test it for values you know are the, test, the values that you are going to use in practice and not the negative values that people will invent to break your system. Right? That kind of values you, you seldomly test and they have to be tested much more in this kind of setting, of course. So for the distance, I won't show you many of those examples, but that's a very important part of the testing. Okay. Uh, so then a little bit more about this, this Kademlia protocol then. So you have this key, and how do you now select a subset of all the nodes that you need to select? So this is the tree of all the 0, 1 combinations and on depth of 160, and this is the key that you have, and that's your identity. So you want to select nodes in the system, and Cardemia basically says, look at the prefix, and the first zero here, there are also a lot of nodes, well, the half of, and, uh, of 2 to the power of 160, which start with a 1. Those nodes, you take 8 out of them. So you take 8 nodes that start with a z 1, and not more than that. And then you take 8 nodes that start with 0, 1 and you take another eight nodes that start with zero, zero, zero. So you always take eight nodes for each subtree in this tree. And you take those nodes, and that's your complete set of nodes that you want to talk to. That's what Kademlia says. And that gives you then the subset that is interesting for doing this. Okay? Uh, and then the, the property that, that is connected to this says, well, each peer can reach each other peer in less than log n steps. And, and it's the 
uh, is the 2 to the power of 160 steps. So in 160 steps, you can reach any node in this network if you randomly choose the, the keys so that it work. And that's also something then that you want to test, which I don't do tonight. But I, that's the kind of things you want to test automatically by generating your test cases. So the basic ID in test case generation is that you uh, can use it to generate your test for unit testing, component testing, system testing, whatever uh, level of testing you want to do. It's less work and more fun. So let's try to, to show you the fun of, of doing that by uh, st starting that up. Just a little demo on how it would work. Let me see here. So this is Erlang, and I understood that not all of you have seen Erlang before, but this is just a header of uh, a program. And then there is some uh, libraries and functions that, that I import. I import the, the function that I want to test. That's the function D. Okay. So now I want to write something like, like this here. I want to express that for any x, dx x equals 0. Yeah, that's, that's something I want to test. And I do that by writing a property of a logical property for testing this instead of writing a test case. Uh, I could call it well, reflexivity or something like that. That's the name of that property. And I would write something like for all, and now I need an x, which is an identity, uh, an, uh, a key. Basically, I can also call it key. It doesn't really matter. One ID X and another ID Y. So for all IDs Y. And what should hold? Oh, sorry, I need only one, of course. I was only testing this, that the distance equals zero for all those Xs that I choose. Yeah. So now I need a random identity. And in, in this quick check approach, there is a kind of a library of random uh, data objects that you can make so I can define my, my random data to be something between 0 and 255, an 8-bit value. That's not as big as you want, probably. For, but for testing, you can start with smaller values first, and then you use tests for testing. So this would say I have a random identity between 0 and 255. And for any such identity, the distance between x and x equals 0. So that's, that's the thing I want to test. And in order to do so, you compile your Erlang program. I think, is this readable? Probably a bit bigger. No, I can't really make it bigger, the font here. That's a pity. Yeah, fine. OK. So now I can start my quick check program to generate to generate 100 random values for x and test this property. That would look like this. For each test case that we have executed, generated and executed, it has one dot. And it went so fast you don't see the dots going because this is such a simple function to, to actually test. But we have tested it 100 times, but you don't really know what I have tested, right? So there is a lot of kind of machinery around this to show you what you have been testing. So I can collect all the X's in my tests to show, you some, to show me some statistics what did I actually test here. So I can enrich my property by saying, give me some statistics while I was testing and show them on the screen. So then I compile again and I test. And now I get the values for which I have tested. And some values actually happen to occur several times in my test cases because my domain was very, very little. So I get the same kind of values all the time. So that is property-based testing in a nutshell. We run, we generate random data, and we run tests on that. So it would be nice to see what happens if things go wrong. So let's write another property. There was something like irreflexivity, this one, right? dx, y, the distance between x and y, plus the distance between y and z, is larger or equal the distance to x and z. That's if you go via another point, then you have a longer distance. So let's, let's try to, to write that one. 
uh, how do we call that? Triangulation or something like that. Triangle. So for all, now I have to generate two things, an x and a y, and I put them in, the, in a pair directly. That is easier, I guess. Hmm? Oh, I need a z too. Yep, thank you for. So I need three values, and I write that dx comma y plus d y comma z is large equal d x comma zeta. That that's my property. Then this will hold hopefully. So let's compile and run that triangulation property. Triangle. And the, the boring thing now will be you see only dots. Right? That's really boring because all the tests pass. But let's make a mistake, and that's not easy, such that it doesn't hold anyway. I could do this, right? That should not hold. But probably it's always greater. And that might be the case, actually, here. That should definitely hold, right? So I could say it's a reverse the equality. That's always a good thing. Yep, thanks, Tobias. Reverse the equality and a run test. And then what you see here, and I will scroll up a little bit, what you see is that you you failed off the one test. I was lucky. One random test, bang. And then you see this, this shrinking st stuff here. And that says, well, I chose x, y, and z in this way. 88, 167, 112. And the x-oring, etc., didn't really work. But then the minimum counterexample, the minimum test case that fails, is when x is 0, y is 1, and z is 0. And I guess you can, you can actually see that here, because the distance between x and y, 0 and 1, there will be 1, I guess. And then the distance between y and z is also 1, so this is 2, and this is, only one. This is actually 0, because x and z are the same. So, and that's... 2 is definitely not smaller than 0, and that's the minimum example in x, y, and z that it can produce to, to find the counterexample in this property. So that is property-based testing in a nutshell. If you have this nice mathematical stuff, it's easy to see that we do this. It's harder to see how we do this for far more complex things like stateful programs and, and stuff like that. So I don't really show that here, but I will show a slide because time is running out as well as that it's much harder to understand all that in a 20-minute talk. So, property-based testing in a nutshell, you take your property, you generate your test cases until you find a failing test case, then you take that failing test case, you shrink that to the minimum failing test case, and that's the one you present to the user as saying, this is really wrong. Helps you a lot in debugging, you have the minimum test case that goes wrong. And you need to do that kind of minimalization because when you have random values, and random values for a random length of your test case, you might have a lot of rubbish in there, which is not important for the test case. And I know that some people really love looking at long log files and just analyze them for days, but we, we rather like a very short log file that you can see this is wrong. So that's why we, we minimize that automatically for you and take the debugging part away from, from what you're actually doing. In real software, properties are far more complex, absolutely far more complex. You have state, uh, you need stateful properties. We put a state machine model in place there where we can represent that kind of state. And then you, you shrink to the minimum failing test case in a different way. Normally, when we do this, we, in, the, in the state machine model, we say these are the API functions that you have. And you take a random subset of the API, API functions with random arguments, but it should make sense, more or less. Then we compute the number of those random tests, and as long as they pass, it's okay. And if they fail, then we start taking away the parts of the test case which are not important for provoking that failure. And we end up with a minimum test case in that way. So then it's not just a minimum value, it's a minimum sequence of calls to that value. Here we can do all kinds of things like in fault injection as well, where we can say, well, look, we, we, we know that we are going to inject a fault in the system. How is the system reacting on that? So that's uh, the other part that we do. Skip this demo. 
Uh, so, yeah, this was for Kademnia, for example, we should then have as a property of the system that each peer can reach each other peer in less than log n steps. And that's something we could try to, to put <coughs> as a property in a state machine model where we then try to populate such routing graphs and see that for any random routing graph, we can actually achieve this, this property, which is very useful in finding subtle bugs in the border cases of this protocol. So that's basically how it works. We did this for many core components at the moment in our uh, blockchain uh, project, so that the core components are really kind of well tested now. That was it about testing blockchains. <laughs> Questions? So are the test cases that you use for testing the blockchain public as well? Are the test cases that we use for the blockchain uh, the, uh, public as well? The answer is yes. The, the, the models are absolutely public, we, and we generate them for the models. So even the models where we generate them from are public. And the test cases are also available. Does that not support the potential security problem? See, if there was a flaw in your model and someone caught that in your test cases, which would mean that there's like, you know, maybe if the model was correct, then there was something that you are kind of test missed because the model wasn't correct. So the question is, if the model is not correct, but there's still a bug in your, uh, and there's still a bug in your test case. Don't we then learn from that by looking at the model? Yeah, or like an attacker might. Yeah, an attacker might look at the model and say, "Well, look, there's this. Uh, there might still be a bug." Well, it, the chance is less, I guess, than when you have 1,000 test cases manually written for testing that that system. There's always a possibility that we make a mistake, but the model reflects what the code is doing and reflects what the specification says it should be doing because it, we try to stick to what the paper or the model says. So if we base our blockchain on the wrong kind of scientific results, and we, then we might indeed have an, an, a vulnerability there that people can exploit. But that's not different from any other approach uh, in writing test cases. Yeah. Oh. I have a comment on that. I um, attended a, a session on uh, on security a couple of years ago, and uh, <coughs> there they were the experts were adamantly saying that security through obscurity does not work anymore because the hackers are so sophisticated that they will find your bugs. Uh, so what you're doing by hiding your implementation is just Basically, yeah, essentially, you are forfeiting the the chance to get help. So I guess nowadays a lot of companies are actually inviting you. You uh, you introduce bug bounties, for example. You invite white hat hackers to try to find flaws in your system, and then you give them a bounty if they find a security flaw that can be verified, and then you can uh, you can fix it. So actually opening up your code and opening up all, or revealing all your tests actually yeah. gives the, the good people out there a chance to find the flaws. And they are likely to do that too, especially if you pay them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any more? Okay, thank you. <laughs>